Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming to OISE's alumni event uh, featuring Dr. Suzanne Stewart's keynote. We're very, very pleased to have you here. Now I would like to introduce you and invite our elders, Elder Kat Krigger and Coco Miss Jackie Lavalle from the OISE Indigenous Network. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sim. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm very pleased to receive, uh, as is traditional for us, we receive a tobacco tie, uh, a tobacco gift to, uh, for the work that we're going to do and for what we, we're going to add to this evening and uh, what we're going to learn this evening in a good way. We're going to start off with a smudging ceremony. We're, we're going to do that up here with some of us and sing a song. And then we'll speak a few words and then we'll work into our evening. So, think what? Now, we know Ni mo shay ni no jay ma ingan kwa ni deshnikas pa bi jay shindo dem gaya ni jay ay guani medeo o jibwe bo de wada mi al gankan kwa andao bangi we wem te koshe and we we're, we're honored by by the display of tradition um, this is really uh, the beautiful color that's reserved for the bear clan. While Kat is coming around with the smudge, I'm going to sing what we call or make reference to as an invitation song. And the invitation song is sung in the language, and uh, it was given for this occasion to do an opening to invite spirit to come where we are gathered. When we're gathered in this manner, it becomes a traditional space, a very sacred place. And... Uh, we honor that circle. Miigwech. Okay. Owena bojo, makwa gish gadin dish na kaas, shikan dodam, kiyugin dunjaba, kiyugin nishnabe and dao, miwa gaja kin dish na kaas. There's uh, always there's words that come before all else. Always there's words of thanks and uh, words of invitation and welcome. One of the things I want to acknowledge is the, the land that we're on right now. Um, acknowledge where we're walking, where we're guests, and that is this land it was originally uh, the caretakers, and I say that carefully, the caretakers of this land were originally the Mississaugas. I'm not going to add new credit because I don't think that was originally in their language, so I'm going to say the Mississaugas, and I think before that it was shared a bit by the Huron Windat as well. But I just want to acknowledge that, um, be thankful that we'll walk on this land, and also to recognize that I'm a guest here. I'm, I'm Cayugan, Delaware, from upstate New York, and my mom's German English, so I'm partly from across the water and partly from uh, the other side of the, what's now a border, and that I'm a guest here, and I, I consider it my privilege to walk here as a guest. And when I walk on this land as a guest, I, I honor those rules of respect, where I try to walk softly, try not to hurt every, anything, that I look to all the people that are here and respect them for how they walk, how they talk, how they pray, and how they are. And also, uh, the reverse is true, that you're expected to be treated as a guest. You're offered um, a nice place by the fire, you're offered some words of wisdom, or you share a culture, or a nice warm robe to wear, and some food, uh, a place in a lodge of warmth. And we have all those things here tonight. We have lots of people. We have our, our, our fire going. We have some wonderful people to share their wisdom and some wonderful guests. And I want to welcome everybody in that way and say, oh, be quick. This song, uh, this song that I'm going to share with you is a song that came to me when I fasted, especially for this kind of occasion. And it uh, makes mention of our first teacher, and his name was Wayne Bojo. He was promised in the beginning of time 
that when he finished his work here, after he brought all of these teachings and the stories, that a place was reserved for him in the sky world. And that is where he will sit and, and, uh, and help us out. His name was Wayne Bojo, and the song calls out to Wayne Bojo. Wayne Bojo, I hear him. Ni nun doa. Wayne Bojo, I see him. Ni wabama. Wayne Bojo inspires me to, to be grateful and to be thankful. And then Wayne Bojo. I treasure all of the teachings, everything that he brought this way for us. And I do appreciate it so very much. Now help me, Gwetch. When a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, ni non de wa, when a bourgeois, ni non de wa, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois. When a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, me when a bourgeois, me when a bourgeois. When a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, Nizagia, when a bourgeois, Nizagia. When a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois, when a bourgeois. Nikonig enough, Nikonis Kinegwa, all my relations, Nikwech. So I just wanted to add a little more. We, we did a smudging ceremony here. We, we uh, used one of our four sacred medicines, in this case some sage, and we put it in that abalone shell and burnt it. And you saw what we did with it when it came around to our, our little core group. And uh, it would be nice to do everybody in the room, but the fire alarms would go off and we'd empty all of Oise and it probably wouldn't go over that great. But it is implied that everybody's included in that, and that smoke goes through the room. And my, my uh, good friend, Ernie Benedict, used to say, the smoke shall pierce the sky. And what that kind of meant was your prayers, your thoughts, your wishes will all be carried. They'll always rise. They'll always go to where they, they should go. So when we do that, when we, we rub our hands through that smoke that way, it's, uh, it's so that whatever we touch, we're going to touch with our hearts. And we take some over our heart. So whatever we feel there, we're going to feel with our heart and over our head or eyes or ears. We breathe a little bit in. And that's so whatever we look at, we're going to look at with our hearts. Whatever comes from our mouth, whatever we speak is going to come from our heart. Very importantly, whatever we listen to, whatever we hear, we're going to listen to with our heart. Maybe if that's, if all things were done that way to begin with, then um, maybe tonight's talk wouldn't be important intergenerational trauma. Um, because if everybody thought that way, everybody come together that way, everybody did things that way, then maybe things would be a lot smoother to begin with. But tonight we're here for, um, to hear wonderful words by um, Dr. Stewart. Yes. Dr. Have trouble Stewart. not saying Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne. So. Miigwech. Miigwech.
Thank you so much. I would now like to introduce you to Dean Julia O'Sullivan, the Dean of Boise. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Jackie and Kat, uh, for the wonderful opening ceremony. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight to welcome you and welcome back many of you to OISE and the University of Toronto, located on the traditional lands of the Mississauga of New Credit and other First Nations over the years. My job is to introduce the guest speaker, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge um, our tremendous um, director of alumni relations, Sim, who since she took the job a few months ago has been calling our alumni home in droves and we're very glad to see you and who is responsible for organizing all these special alumni events. Thank you, Sim. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Suzanne Stewart is an associate professor here at OISE in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development. She's a counseling psychologist who obtained her PhD from the University of Victoria in 2007, and just after that she took up her position here at OISE. Besides her work as an associate professor, she has coordinated the Indigenous Education Network out of OISE for several years. She serves as the first chief advisor or special advisor to the Dean on Aboriginal Education, and she chairs our community-based Aboriginal Council here at OISE. She is active in the community beyond our walls, both locally and nationally, and increasingly internationally. She holds a clinical position with the Natives Men's Residence here in Toronto. She consults widely with uh, organizations including Corrections Canada, the Centre for Addictions and Mental Health, and Anishinaabek Health here in Toronto. And currently she serves as the chair of the Aboriginal Psychology uh, Section of the Canadian Psychological Association. She is a prolific and outstanding scholar. In her uh, short career, she has published over 30 articles and delivered almost 70 or more than 70 now invited lectures, presentations, keynote addresses, along with numerous workshops. She has, over the course of a short career, been awarded just over $1 million in grants and awards for her research. And her most recent award is to be named a Canada Research Chair for her work in Aboriginal homelessness and life transitions. And as most of you here know, this is the most distinguished award for active scholars in our country today. She is, um, as well, the first Aboriginal scholar to hold a Canada Research Chair at the University of Toronto, and we are terribly proud of her. <laughs> All of these uh, achievements, together and raised to the power of 20, pale in comparison to what Suzanne believes is her greatest achievement of all, and they're there sitting beside her, her four beautiful children, her son, Cohen, her eldest daughter, Scarlet Rose, her second daughter, Raven, and her little daughter, um, Danae. So, so, please welcome Suzanne. Well, I feel a little tearful now, so I'm not really sure if I can speak after that. I'd like to say uh, thank you, uh, Massey Cho, my language, to the elders uh, for opening us in a good way, reminding us of who we are as spiritual people, all of us. And I'd like to thank the Dean as well for that beautiful welcome. It's really hard for me to um, hear stuff like that because I'm not really used to thinking of myself in those ways because you heard all the work that I've done over the last seven years, well, 17 years if you count the time I went to school, but over the last seven years, you know, I've been kind of busy the rest of the time dealing with this stuff because my oldest daughter is going to be eight tomorrow. So you see where I've done the last eight years as well with Cohen's help. And I'm a, I'm a single parent with these children. And, 
and Cohen, my son, is, and my family who are here, my friends, my family, my students, all these people all come together to support me in doing all these things. And without them, there's absolutely no way that any of this, including these kids, could happen. So I'd like to acknowledge my, my family, my people, I call them, that are here in the front and at the back. So thank you to you guys. So uh, let's... Let's um, get started because I know we're behind schedule. So I'd like to thank the uh, Alumni Association for inviting me to speak tonight. It's a great honor to be here to share uh, my work uh, with all of you. And, um, and I'd also like to thank Sam. I don't know where she went. She's hiding because she is really amazing. She's there, uh, there. She's really, <laughs> she's, she's five star. She's the one. She's the five star person that brings us all together. So thank you. Um, so we already did our territorial acknowledgement, uh, and I am also a visitor here. I'm from the Yellowknife Dene First Nation in the Northwest Territories. And uh, to give you a little bit of my story to start out with, um, these are my grandparents, Gabriel and Mary Adele Doctor. Uh, they both went to residential school, and actually my grandfather's dad, my great-grandfather, I recently learned, also went to residential school. So we have multiple generations of people in my family um, who've gone to residential school. And yes, I was born with the last name Doctor. So you can see when I was married to their dad, Andrew Stewart, why well, I thought it would be a good idea to change my last name to Stewart, because what would I be? Doctor, doctor, and then you'd just be laughing all the time and no one would be taking me seriously. So, uh, so, uh, so I, I changed my last name from doctor to steward. And this is a picture of my mother. Um, she's a young woman, as you can see, a beautiful young woman. Uh, this was taken last year on Mother's Day. And this is a picture of my dad. Uh, my dad is uh, Cree and Russian. That's a good Canadian combination from the prairies of Alberta. Um, and he comes and visits. So that's where I came from. And this is sort of my future, where I'm going. My kids, they're here in person, so you don't need to see their picture. <laughs> so, so that's sort of where I came from. And to give you a little bit of my history, um, I grew up like a lot of people in our communities did, and that is not understanding what a traditional uh, family is in terms of the European sense of family, because our family had a lot of interruptions due to the colonial process. So we have multiple generations of people put into residential school. Uh, in my family, we have multiple generations of children in foster care. Um, we have many of those things happening that have interrupted the way my life has developed. So as a result of these processes, I've, I ended up being on my own from the age of 13. I quit school um, in grade nine, and I never went back to school till I was 25, till I woke up one day after reading Freud and decided I wanted to become a psychologist. So I went back to school at age 25 as a mature student, it was called back then, in the, uh, I guess that was in the 90s. And I was able to, to, be, to do okay in school as a mature student because they had this sort of sink or swim approach for mature students, 25 and older. You could just go, and if you passed, you could stay. And if you didn't pass, you had to leave. Um, so, uh, so I managed to pass, and uh, that's how I, uh, I got through school uh, as an adult, which was on my love of psychology because I'd spent most of my young adulthood trying to make sense of a lot of things that happened to me and to people in my family. And when I started reading Western psychological things, some of those things sort of made sense to me about why people acted the way that they did compared to the knowledge that I had previous to that, which was nothing. I didn't know anything about why people did what they did because in my family, our traditional knowledge transmission had come to a halt when people started going to residential schools. So I didn't get those answers from my culture about what it was that we needed, what we needed to be healthy, what we needed to learn, all those things. We didn't have those answers in my family because the only answers that we had in our family was to forget about everything by running away, by doing drugs, by drinking, by those sorts of things. Because that's what, what was given to us in place of uh, our culture and our practices and our language that was taken away. 
So that's a little bit about where I came from. So I'm going to, so sort of with that background, I'm going to talk a little bit about Aboriginal education and intergenerational trauma. Uh, are you guys going to be good up there? Okay. Um, so there's two reasons, really, two big reasons why we might want to look at Aboriginal education uh, differently than we would look at other forms of education, general Western education. One is because there is a very big difference, a profound and wide difference between Aboriginal worldviews and Western worldviews. And when I use the term Aboriginal, that's sort of a blanket term that's used to refer to three distinct groups of people, and that is First Nations, which includes status and non-status Indians, Métis, and Inuit people. So Aboriginal and, Dig and Indigenous are two words that are used sort of interchangeably as blanket general terms to refer to those three distinct cultural groups of people. But generally speaking, Aboriginal people as a whole prefer to be referred to by their specific tribal affiliation. So if I'm, you know, Yellow Knife Dene, that's what I'd like to be referred to as opposed to Native or Aboriginal, because it's sort of a blanket statement that doesn't fit for people specifically within that group. So the worldviews of Indigenous peoples as a whole and Western European worldviews are extremely different. And I'll talk in a minute about what those differences look like. So that's one reason why we would want to look at Aboriginal education from a cultural perspective. The second reason is um, a little bit more academic, and that is that there is a significant gap in educational attainment and achievement for Aboriginal students um, within all school systems at all levels of education from kindergarten to post-secondary. So just to give you a little snapshot of what some of these differences in worldviews are between traditional indigenous ways of knowing and being and Western worldviews um, are, you know, in the indigenous paradigm, there's a collectivist orientation. In the uh, Western, when the Western world, it's more individualist. Um, in the indigenous worldview, there's a holistic conception of the self and the world, meaning that traditionally an indigenous worldview sees all people and things as having four elements, the spiritual, the emotional, the physical, and the mental. And part of what we did here today, opening um, the traditional spiritual opening that our elders provided for us was part of bringing in that holistic aspect to what we're doing by bringing in the spiritual. In the, in the Western paradigm, there's more of a dualistic understanding of the self and the world. That is that mind-body split that came from Descartes' work, uh, ontological and epistemological work in the 1500s. Um, when we talk about Indigenous education or Indigenous health or Indigenous anything as needing to be more holistic, what people are usually referring to is that we need to pay attention to the spiritual because that's the piece that's missing in the Western paradigm. When we talk about uh, education, when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about learning, when we say holistic, it needs to be holistic. What we mean is it needs to pay attention to those four parts. And the part that's most often missing in the Western world is the attention to the spiritual. Oh, I keep wanting to say, okay, next slide, but I have it. <laughs> So, you know, these differences are so profound that we really need to start to reconceptualize how we look at education um, if we're going to start to change how we're going to do business in terms of teaching and learning in the Aboriginal community specifically, but in Canada in general. Because these things that I'm going to share with you are not only relevant to working with Aboriginal students, they're actually relevant to working with all students. And as we go along, I'm going to reveal a little bit more on why that is. Because if I told you all right now, you'd just get up and leave and you'd have no reason to stay till the end, right? So another important implication from understanding these profound differences in worldviews and what they mean for education is understanding that actually most ways 
of teaching and learning and assessing learning are based on this Western paradigm that focuses on the problems and the deficits of children and learners. If we were to start teaching and learning and assessing that teaching from an Indigenous worldview, we would actually be focusing on the strengths and the solutions that students bring rather than on what's wrong with them and what the deficits are. And that's one of the biggest issues with the Western model of education and assessment um, in Aboriginal contexts is that there is no attention to the strengths and the solutions and it's mostly based on a deficit model. So I want to say a few words about this gap in educational achievement because this is something that has become very prolific in the media recently. There's headlines everywhere about how poorly Aboriginal students are doing and in one way this is true because we do have the numbers and the numbers don't lie, right? We can't argue with the numbers. Numbers say things like, you know, there's a high dropout rate for Aboriginal students compared to non-Aboriginal students. This is true. Um, unemployment for Aboriginal people as a whole, as a population, is very high, 50% um, for adults, for men, and sometimes 90% in some Aboriginal communities, so that is reserve communities. Um, and another reason that Aboriginal students don't do well in school, particularly in elementary and secondary school, which is where much of the research has been done, is that there are many um, inaccuracies and omissions related to Aboriginal identity, culture, and history within textbooks. So within the curriculum, Things are not presented in a factual or realistic way. And apparently, according to Kirkness's research, this, uh, this adds to why students don't want to stay in school, right? Because they're not appropriately represented within the material that they're being taught. So... What I want us to do is just for a minute to look at this data on how poorly Aboriginal students do in school and what this actually really means. So to give you a little bit of background on this, there are currently, according to census data, there are um, about one million Aboriginal people in Canada, and that represents about 4% of the population. This number is growing exponentially every year. Within the Aboriginal population, over half the population is under the age of 24. Of that youth population, 24 and under, over half of that population is 16 and under. That's these people. So Aboriginal people represent the fastest and largest and youngest growing population of any demographic in Canada right now. So when we look at this data, and it says things like 40% of Aboriginal people aged 20 to 24 don't have a high school diploma, compared to 13 among non-Aboriginal Canadians. And the rate for this is actually higher for people living on reserve, and even higher for uh, Aboriginal people living in very remote communities such as Inuit people, we see how alarming this kind of data is. We have a large youth population. We have alarming rates of uh, high school uh, drop of high school dropouts, of unemployment, of people not being able to get jobs or find jobs or stay in school, um, according to this data. But actually, when we look at this a little closer, this may not be an accurate representation of the picture because right now we know that 60% of Aboriginal people live off reserve, that is, they live in urban areas. Those Aboriginal people who are living in urban areas are not part of this data because they may not be self, not they may not, they are probably not self-identifying within the school system. So we, we only actually have data that represents people from within the very marginalized population within the larger population of Aboriginal people. So 40% or less of the population is being captured in this data that's mostly from students who are on reserve because the students who are in the urban areas who are doing well, 
such as these kids, are not being identified within the data because the school systems across Canada have not been able to capture who is Aboriginal within their schools. So they may have census data that says there's X numbers of Aboriginal young people living in this region of Toronto, but that those numbers aren't showing up within the school system data. So their, their numbers are all missing. And these are young people who are graduating from high school, going on to university, uh, getting A's in their classes, doing things that do not fit within this data. So, so when we understand that there's, a, there's this two-tiered system for education, meaning that children on the, on, who live on reserves go to uh, band-run schools that are federally funded and mandated, the rest of them, over 60% of the population, live off reserves and go to schools that are provincially mandated and funded with a completely different system of education where their data and their information is not being captured. So, um, so when, we look at, when we look at what this means, what does this mean? Am I making sense to anyone? Everyone sort of looks, some people are like, yeah. Other people are like, what the heck is she talking about? <laughs> what, what, what do you guys think about what I'm saying? Has anyone heard about this? Is anyone aware of this? We are. We live through it. Right, so, so basically, you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that when we understand that Aboriginal students don't do well in school. Well, it's, it's for several reasons. One is there's a two-tiered system of education in which students who live on reserves go to one of the 507 um, schools that are, that are operated by First Nations communities and regulated by the federal government through Indian Affairs, still regulated by Indian Affairs through the Indian Act. The rest of the students who don't live on reserve go to public schools in cities that are provincially funded and provincially mandated. So given this wide range of contexts, it's actually very difficult for us to make assumptions on Aboriginal education based on a small amount of data that's actually not representative of the so-called Aboriginal population. So in other words, we, we should probably be resisting this impulse to oversimplify what this data means about Aboriginal students uh, not doing well in school across the board, when in fact there's probably many students who are actually doing well, but we, we don't capture that data because of this two-tiered system. So that's the sort of background. That's why we would want to talk about Aboriginal education here. Um, and given that these indicators are significant, uh, this difference in worldviews, cultural worldviews, and this gap in achievement and uh, attainment of education, as well as the data around that being sort of suspect, we don't really know what that means, why don't we start looking at Aboriginal education from an Aboriginal perspective? And an Aboriginal perspective on teaching and learning is something that has a worldview that suggests that education is about community, it's about relationship, and it's about empowerment. And that these three things, these three central things, that define education happen along a foundation of colonialism for Aboriginal people, both right now and in the past. So this is actually a theory that's been formalized in the literature called Aboriginal or Indigenous Pedagogy, and it places education in the context of values, cultural values, uh, relationship, and the historical realities. And for us in Canada, the historical realities trace back to the colonial context. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. I want to talk about, I want to move back from here because I feel like this is awkward. That's better. I don't want to be in front of that podium. It's better. Um, 
So that's what I'd like to do for a few minutes is talk about this colonial context of education and why that's important to Aboriginal education. And I want to talk about the colonial history, the present colonial context, and what the future looks like in terms of the context of education for Canada as a whole. Why do we want to talk about the colonial history? Because it's important to acknowledge the traumatic losses and the strengths that we've all experienced in our history, because those are the things that will help us to learn and teach in a more effective way, acknowledging those things. I know I sound like a psychologist now. How did that happen? So let's talk about the past for a minute, the colonial past. In Canada, education was historically used as a tool of oppression on Aboriginal people. How did this happen, you might ask? Well, it happened through something called residential schools. And residential schools were an extensive school system that was set up by the federal government and was uh, administered across Canada by churches. So I have some pictures that I'm going to show, and they're a little bit graphic. Well, they're graphic to me, and it just makes my voice crack a little even just to think about it, because this is something that I deal with. This is something my parents deal with, my grandparents, my children. This is an issue that is a today issue for us. This isn't something that happened hundreds of years ago and that we just need to get over. This is something that we're not going to get over for many generations. So. I have some pictures of residential schools. So this was taken from a website, The Fall and Feather Productions. Um, this is a school uh, in Manitoba. So what is residential school? Well, the primary objective of residential schools were to forcibly remove and isolate children from their culture, their families, their homes, and their communities and to, in order to assimilate them into dominant culture. Um, so this is a picture of children who were being forcibly removed. They were put into trucks. I don't know where this, this was taken from. I think this was from Saskatchewan. This is a picture from my community, from, uh, from Bechico, which, is, which is, used to be called Ray Edzo. So because it's isolated up there, they used to take children by bush plane. They'd come into the village. The RCMP would gather up the children and put them in the planes and fly them to the residential schools. This was at St. Michael's. This was taken in about 1974, this picture. There's a lot of them on the internet if you want to look at them. So residential schools were created based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultural beliefs and spirituality were inferior or unequal to Euro-Canadian Christian ones. So the goal of residential schools, as stated in the Indian Act, was to kill the Indian in the child. This is a picture of my mother's uh, residential school photo um, from a Keicho Hall that she went to uh, in the Northwest Territories. She went to residential school for 14 years. She was about 14 when this picture was taken. In 2008, Prime Minister Harper made an apology an official apology to Aboriginal people. And he said, today we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong and has caused great harm and has no place in our country. So some of the facts around residential schools. So about 150,000 Aboriginal children are documented um, to have attended these schools from 1870. Uh, to the sometime in the 1990s. Um, at least 3,000 children are known to have died, and 500 of those um, have identities that are unknown. Disease was the major killer, so influenza, tuberculosis, um, and second to disease was exposure, uh, neglect, malnutrition, drowning, that sort of thing. And many children who attended residential schools were victims of physical assault and sexual abuse, 
and many children died trying to run away or by suicide. So here's another residential school from uh, Saskatchewan. This was a bigger one, I guess. Um, these are some documents uh, from the restitution, the reconciliation and restitution process that was part of Harper's apology. So um, surviving uh, survivors of residential school as part of the restitution from his apology uh, were compensated financially, but in order to be compensated, they had to fill out a document um, that detailed what school they went to, the abuse they experienced, the harms suffered and treatments that they got for it, their education and work history and their future care. So this is the kind of thing survivors of residential school had to detail in order to um, be compensated financially for those experiences. So this understanding of what residential school was um, can exist to give us all an opportunity to create a new relationship between Indigenous people and institutions of education, like OISE, like the school system, like educational psychology, and can allow all of us to begin to work towards ending that traumatic experience of education and inviting Indigenous culture into the school, into uh, teaching, into learning, into assessments, into whatever it is that we do in the Western educational system. Today, Aboriginal people in Canada continue to live under colonial oppression in the school system because what some writers and academics and researchers have suggested is that when non-Indigenous forms of education are used with Indigenous people, that's a continued form of oppression because it delegitimizes and devalues Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous ways of teaching and learning. So in the future, we can think about ending this sort of oppression through education by working from an Indigenous perspective on teaching and learning. So, Indigenous perspectives on teaching and learning, Indigenous pedagogy, which I talked about earlier at the beginning, fundamentally embeds community participation in every step of teaching and learning. And by virtue of that community participation actually brings in cultural identity, brings in cultural knowledge in all levels of what we can do as educators. And this is a multifaceted and ongoing process. So it doesn't mean, you know, add Aboriginal and stir. We bring the elders in at the beginning, you know, they do an opening, then, you know, we forget all about the spiritual and then we do a traditional closing at the end. That is not Aboriginal education. That's add Aboriginal and stir. And that's what a lot of people do. And this can be said for many things, right? It's about embedding culture and community participation at every level of what we do. I like that, add Aboriginal and stir. Isn't that funny? Nobody laughed. You guys, come on, laugh. This is supposed to be add Aboriginal and stir. <laughs> <laughs> they're not laughing. They don't even, they're embarrassed of me. <laughs> so what does this mean to embed particip community participation into education from an indigenous way of teaching and learning? Well, it means just inviting the community into whatever you're doing. It means bringing the community in to help you create curriculum, deliver classes, uh, work with the teachers, work with the children, work with the students, work with the adults. It means bringing local, traditional, cultural knowledge into every process and every aspect of what it is we're doing. Seems pretty easy, actually, doesn't it? Doesn't that seem sort of easy in a way? Yeah. When I don't know what to do, what do I do? I ask the children, I ask the elders. 
What should I do? It's easy, it's French, Latin. <laughs> Easier. Easier. <laughs> so coming from an Aboriginal perspective in education means holding a perspective that recognizes and honors this colonial history, this colonial traumatic experience of education and remembering that this is actually the backdrop of education. While I might be here today with my beads and feathers and my smoke and my this and that, that actually doesn't mean anything when people are afraid to come into the school because their parents went to residential school or they went to residential school. None of this is going to mean nothing to those people. So we have to acknowledge that history and we have to be respectful of that history and understand that every Aboriginal person who's alive in Canada today, me, my children, you, them, her, the guy on the street, the person in 7-Eleven, whoever they are, they've all been touched by residential school either directly or indirectly and they carry with them that trauma, that history. So acknowledging that and understanding that this has an impact on education as a whole, because it also has an impact on all of the people who didn't go to residential school because they carry with them the privilege of not having gone to residential school. What does it mean for you that you didn't go to residential school when you're sitting next to somebody who did? What does that mean? You know, it means something, and it means, but it means something different to everybody. And we have to acknowledge that, that the, go, the residential school itself has an impact on people who went and people who didn't go. So healing for many Indigenous people as a group, as a whole, as a population, is about healing from this trauma of colonialism. And in the context of education, Residential school is a site of multiple traumas. So here's an example, this picture of multiple generations that are affected by residential school. So even though I'm not in the picture, you can pretend I'm in the picture because I took the picture. So that's my dad, he went to residential school. Then there's me, daughter of residential school survivors, because I didn't go to residential school, but my four younger brothers and sisters did. My younger brothers and sisters went, and I didn't, because I was sent off to foster care, right? Um, so he went to residential school. So that, that has had an impact on me in many ways, like I'm not always a good parent, I don't know what family is, la la la, those sort of things. Um, I'm always running around, you know, trying to figure out who I am. So that impacts how I parent my son. That's his cousin, who's one year older than him. Him and his girlfriend, they have a baby. That we have four generations of people in my family directly impacted by residential school. Am I making sense to people, sort of, by giving this example? So this is just my family's example. But my dad's a good-looking guy, right? <laughs> and my son's a good-looking guy. And my, my nephew and his girlfriend, they're, they're nice-looking people, right? They're, they're handsome and smart people, so they're going to be okay. So what this means is that Native people might view the system of education with mistrust, right? Because of this history, right? And not just the people who went, but maybe me, maybe my kids, maybe their kids. There's an intergenerational pattern of mistrust for education. So this is one of my mom's best friends and when I went back to our community in Yellowknife this summer, she ran into me, this was just we ran into each other in town and she just looked right at me. She's like, are you Elise doctor's daughter? I'm like, yeah. She's like, you look just like her, but I don't. I don't look like my mom, do it. No, I don't. I don't look like my mom, no. So people stop me. She, she spent 14 years in residential school with my mom, this lady, always smiling, just walking around town smiling all the time. You know, and, and this is how people deal with stuff. They just keep going. So Aboriginal education includes practicing education from an Indigenous perspective. So that means using cultural ways of teaching and learning. 
which means what? Working with the community. That's all it means. It's not mystical. It means working with the local community, doing what the local community says we should do. And it also includes educating all students about what Aboriginal education is and about what residential school is and the intergenerational impacts it has on all Canadians. So when we talk about educating people about Aboriginal residential school, what we actually mean is teaching people what the history of Indigenous peoples are, what treaties and historic agreements are, what the colonial history of Canada is, including the Indian Act, what traditional and contemporary identity is for Aboriginal people. Like there's people who come up to me who think that back home where I'm from, we live in igloos all the time. Like they don't even have igloos where I'm from. Igloo isn't even like a real thing. It's like, you know, like Cohen's laughing because all they did was play with BB guns and ride ATVs all day. I don't know how native that is, really. So why do you think all Canadians need, might need to know these things? Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a legitimate question. Does anybody want to, you know? Why do you think all Canadians might need to know about... Aboriginal history? Oh. Well, I think one way I'll answer, I'll bring my perspective is <laughs> to go back earlier to when you were talking about uh, privilege, about uh, it being a privilege not to have been in residential school. I think the ultimate privilege is not to be aware of that privilege. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, so, and I think in terms of learning communities, I, I think we can't underestimate the extent to which the system of education itself perpetuates negative stereotypes. So it's not just about omission, it's about the way we imply or you know, do, don't counter the impressions that we know people have and we don't make that part of the education experience. So I think that ultimately that's not good for anyone. Yeah, that, that, those are some excellent points. Anyone else? Uh, I think I want to make a point that awareness invites relationship. And uh, not only because I've had that experience myself, but uh, it is a connecting. The being aware is really very connecting. Uh, for example, in 1967, I participated in a production of Louis Riel where I played a, in the Métis assistant to Riel. And since then, and uh, after when I went to university, I began to realize how much there is that we don't know. I consider maybe a little bit more fortunate that I've had that experience. And then experience later on translated in deeper learning and understanding. Uh, when I became a teacher, I found out, uh, uh, well, maybe about 10 years ago, that there are uh, courses in high school that are developed for um, Aboriginal people, and they're being taught. But the process is slow. It, it, the awareness needs to be more spread, more known. The visibility needs to be created in order, not necessarily uh, in an integral way, but in a manner where there's a, an understanding, and an understanding that can give you positive feelings and sentiments of how the indigenous people lived and how they carry on. And of course, there's a whole histor historical background on this. So to create that awareness in order to be able to build relationships yes, right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Other, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't need the microphone. I was just, uh, well, no one, they, 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 they need, they need oh, the microphone. Oh, you're kidding. Okay. Um, 
Uh, you dwelt a little bit on, on, on some of the... Uh, I don't have to stand up. Yes. <laughs> okay. You dwelt a little bit on some of the, the, the positive aspects <laughs> of uh, Aboriginal education. And uh, uh, Ontario has uh, a very... There are no failures in our school system. Uh, we have the potential to be the, the greatest and the, the best educational system in the world. And EQAO... One of our offices, the Education uh, Quality Accountability Office, uh, uh, the, the latest reports for grade 3, 6, and 10 was that our students were achieving over 80%, most of them, in the language of mathematics, both in numeracy... I think my son disagrees with that. <laughs> and in <laughs> semantics. An on the EQAO. Okay. So... Uh, First Nations Canada answered back, of course, and they, uh, they mentioned uh, with the EQAO results in our Native and Canadian schools that over 80 to 96 percent of our students in our, in our Native schools were scoring over 90, 90 to 98 percent. So uh, we, uh, Ontario, hopefully, I'm not sure, um, but I think Ontario... Um, under the rights of freedom, uh, our Charter of Rights that uh, Mr. Trudeau had signed uh, with Queen Elizabeth, uh, the rights of free education um, beyond the democracy of television and uh, freedom of religion. Ontario, you've noticed that more of our Anglican schools, because at the turn of the century we had 500 uh, or more public schools, and there was no room back then. We were known as Orange County, Ontario. There was no room for Catholic schools at that time. So you've noticed nowadays in the landscape, the Oz landscape, uh, that more of our Catholic churches, or our Protestant churches, <coughs> Protestants bowing Catholics, are being bought out by the Catholic schools and the, the Catholic archdiocese. And thus, uh, my vision now, based on that precursor, is that Ontario could be, be following in the footsteps of British Columbia, Quebec, parts of the Northwest Territories, and we could become uh, 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 a one private public school board. And so... Um, that kind of goes so, back to colonialism. So that kind of traces back to that that oppressive the, the model of yeah. the oppressive model. One, one so maybe we should save the rest of the comments for the end because I'm getting looked at like I have to keep going. So we'll come back to the other people who had their hands up. I didn't think there'd be so much enthusiasm for answering the question. <laughs> So one of the reasons that I think that it's important for all people to learn about Aboriginal history and education is because education is actually a political construct and not a biological or technical process. Education, like health. Like, it's easy to understand how health is a political construct, right? Because notions of health depend on what the dominant society says is healthy. Well, education's the same way. People are smart, capable, can do whatever based on what the dominant society says is smart, is capable, is intelligent, can read, can write, can do all these things. And what's the dominant society's measures of intelligence and capability based on? Western European culture, worldview, and values, not indigenous worldview, values and ways of learning, being and doing. So when we think about Aboriginal students not doing well in school, we think about this gap in attainment and achievement, we think about the so-called high levels of learning disorders, mental health disorders, all this in our Aboriginal communities, that's because of this, because education is a political construct that is based on what's happening in the colonial context, what the dominant paradigm is, and who says what is. 
politicians? Absolutely. So I thought this picture was a good illustration of this. This is the dominant cultural, dominant culture's uh, depiction of the identity of the Aboriginal person. When my kids saw that statue at Disney World, they're like, oh, there's Uncle George. And they ran over to him and gave him a big hug. I'm like, stand still, I'm getting a picture of this, you guys. Thank you, Disney. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Walt. So I bring this perspective of working from an Indigenous worldview, an Indigenous pedagogy, not because I'm a Dene person, but because I want to do this, which means that anybody could work from an Indigenous worldview in education. It's not because I'm Native. There's a lot of Native people who don't do Native things. It's because I want to do it, which means anyone could do it, right? Anybody could do it. So when we think about education as a political construct, we also think about what some of the responses are from the Aboriginal community are to education and what education means to them. And this is a poster that I found that, some, that a group of youth had made about education and what they understood education to be and why education, Aboriginal education is something that's important to all people. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with two key ideas. So one is understanding that a vital piece to Aboriginal education, when we talk about that as a topic, is understanding that the focus has to be on understanding, on the understanding and the process of healing, right? Because education represents a site of multiple traumas historically and currently for all Aboriginal people in Canada. This is a picture of my, the day of my mom's residential school hearing. That blonde lady, the, that non-native lady, that's Canada's lawyer, who when she told her long narrative of all of the stuff that happened to her, decided how much money they were gonna give her. And that's my mom in the blue, and that's an elder and another counselor that Canada appointed to be there with us that day was the four of us plus my mom's lawyer in the room all day. So education is about healing from this process for the next generation, the children, so they can be who they're supposed to be as cultural people. That's what education is about, healing from the past hurts and for the new generation, this generation. The second point that I wanna leave you with is popularizing indigenous models of education can actually benefit all people because I think it's true for us to realize that the Western system of education that we use in Canada is not only sometimes or often failing Indigenous students, but it's actually failing a lot of students. A lot of students do not benefit from the educational system. So I think the system could look at Indigenous ways of teaching and learning to begin to better service all all of our young people. So that's it. I'd like to say Massey Cho in my language, thank you, and hand it back to Sim, because she's chairing, right? Oh, and do you want to chair the questions? Or do you want so I guess we have a few minutes for comments or questions. Of Hi, uh, Janet and Dishnikos, Chichok and Dodum, Algonquin and Dao, Mi'kmaq and Dao, and Penobscot and Dao, and also French mix. <laughs> Mostly French mix, but I do have that. Okay. So I wanted to make a comment about why it's important that all uh, Canadian citizens grow up understanding Aboriginal education. And one of the bullet points was uh, understanding treaty rights. Um, so just last month, I teach at a local high school, and when that when the RCMP came in with rifles pointed at elders' heads in El Sabuktuk, and the next day I walk into school, stand in front of my grade nine class, and I have to stand there for the Canadian anthem, and I thought, you know, the average Canadian citizen likes to take 
pride in the fact that they think that we're a very democratic place and we're democratic people. And if the average Canadian child learns about treaty rights and learns that they are treaty people too and they have a responsibility to honor the treaties and understand what they are and the fact that our government is still violating treaty rights, I think that this new generation coming up will take a stand when they understand what their government is doing. So that's my point on the question on the, that last answering that. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, I worked for five years in Saskatchewan running a regional library system and serving uh, 10 uh, First Nations communities with library services in addition to the rest of the population. I really do think we have to get the whole information about the history and background of First Nations people out with regard to not only treaty rights, but also the background. Because even in Saskatchewan, which is approaching parity in population between First Nations and non-First Nations peoples, there's still an incredible gap in prejudices on both sides of the line, so to speak, and it causes incredible problems. And if you want reconciliation and growth and cooperation in a real way that's going to benefit everybody, you have to do the kinds of things you're talking about. You know, I just want to comment on that for a second, and I think you raised an important point about the racism and discrimination that Aboriginal people continue to experience on a daily basis in Canada. And this is something I didn't want to highlight because I don't like to highlight the negative and the problems because, you know, those are things that we all know exist and, you know, we've talked about them to death, like what's wrong and what the problems are. But I think one thing that Canada needs to take responsibility for is for its... Uh, its systemic racist agenda that exists within the educational system. It's not so much the personal racism, because we've all, as non-white people, experienced that in Canada, being called names, spit on. That's why I quit school in grade nine, because I was spit on, beat up, called names every day by those groups of white girls that hated me on a racist basis, made it unsafe for me to go to school. And at that time, the school system was like, well, you know, this is your problem. You know, you have to deal with it. So how did I deal with it? By not going back to school because it wasn't safe. Today, that type of racism has moved to a systemic level where it's almost like the system spits on people, calls them names, beats them up, but in ways that are much more invasive and much more pervasive than something on the surface like that. And... That's right. It's, it's things like that. And it's like how we measure what intelligence is, how we measure success, how we dishonor Aboriginal knowledge and identity within the education system on a systemic level that's much more dangerous than name calling and sticks and stones. Any, did, did, that, did that make people not want to talk anymore? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joyce Nyhoff Young, and I'm with the medical school. And we're undergoing a real time of curriculum renewal and change. And I think there's an, a really wonderful opportunity now to incorporate other voices. You, you mentioned curriculum change. What suggestions would you have for getting alternative perspectives and voices in at a curriculum change level? It's a very complicated curriculum. Any insights would be appreciated. Well, I think um, inviting traditional keepers of knowledge, like elders and traditional teachers, to consult with them, and if on a grander scale would be to establish a steering committee um, from the local Aboriginal community that could advise you on those curriculum changes and developments. Uh, hi. I, I was hoping when you're talking about inter intergenerational trauma that you were going to mention something about the epigenetic uh, transmission of trauma to generations that some of the recent research has been talking about. Do, do well, have, I think do, in do, 25 minutes it's probably hard for me to uh, I, identify okay. every site of uh, the right. transmission okay. of intergenerational it, it, it trauma. It wasn't a criticism. I just yeah. wonder if you had any well, thoughts on that. the blood memory stuff. 
That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, I mean that that's another way, that's another way to look at the transmission of intergenerational trauma, and and there is there is information to substantiate that data, but I think there's also the fact that we all know what the impact of trauma is on ourselves and our families, because every person who lives in the world has experienced some level of trauma that they carry with them, right? And when we're exposed to what the trauma was in education for this population of people, and we relate that to what our own experiences of trauma are, we can begin to understand what that means in this context. Koi koi. Bonjour. Sinikwe and Ishnikaz. I'm an Agonquin from the uh, Agonquins of uh, Pikamwatnagon. I just want to say Massey Cho to Suzanne for inviting me for here for tonight. And for, when, for the Aboriginal education, education, like my parents or my dad did, he went to residential school. And then my dad and my aunts, they never talked about it because a lot of people don't talk about it because it's very painful. And they were told not to talk about it. That's right. And I find it very hurting because I wish they would have said something to us and I would have had a better understanding, but I do have an understand, a much better understanding of it now because I, I know a lot of people that went through the residential schools and stuff and it hurts for them to talk about it. It's like a closed book for right now. And I just, I just felt, I felt like my, I, I wish my dad would have talked to us because he talked our language and he never taught us when we were younger, but I knew he could speak at the Algonquin. I just wish he would have taught us when we were younger. But I just wanted to say Massey Cho, miigwech for inviting me here for tonight. Miigwech for coming and thank you for acknowledging that now is the time when we can continue with the healing around these issues of education. Uh, I really want to thank Oisey for organizing this. Thank you so much. And uh, when you were talking about the trauma, I could just feel it here, honestly. Mm -hmm. But I just want to ask you one question. Like, you relate the, uh, the spiritual power as the source of healing. I don't understand how come, because being a brown by skin, non-white, came to Canada and going through some of the hardships, but somehow the belief in the Almighty and that connection with that spiritual, uh, whatever that power is, whichever form we believe in that, somehow that gave the strength to just keep moving ahead. I would just like to know how does your spiritual powers uh, were not, I'm not saying that they were not um, very um, strong enough to do the healing, but I think that strength comes from that superpower, supernatural power. So if, I'm still shaking, I'm sorry, but because I could just relate to some of the things that you said, what we go through, but somehow this, uh, this uh, connection between the supernatural and the human beings as such, it gives you that strength to consider everyone equal. And today, honestly, I'm so proud. I see God in each one of you. And uh, due to that reason, I, I'm, I don't know, like I have students, I teach in a school which uh, deals with the adults. Everyone is welcome with open arms. We have from the Toronto District School Board, we got this message newly. Uh, came out recently and I was one of the people to do something about it. I'm the equity representative at the school. And the students just love that welcome when it is said in their own language. So I just want to know the connection between the spiritual um, power and the healing process. So I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak for myself. So for myself, uh, I was taught that for, for me and for our people, and I believe this is true to be for all people, and that is that all healing begins with the spiritual, because that's what we have. That's my teaching. And when I think about education, the spirit of education is what's important to me 
in Aboriginal education, in education in general. And I feel like that's what the strength is that has allowed me to conduct my work, to do what I do. Because the spirit of education is the spirit of the children, is the spirit of the community, is the spirit of what it is that we're doing. And that's the good parts, the strong parts, the healthy parts, right? The parts that are untouched by trauma. So I think we're done now, and I think it's time to go back to the Dean. So thank you. Miigwech. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. And thank you, Danae and Raven and Scarlett Rose and Cohen. Um, really, Suzanne, this was um, a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Everybody here uh, joins me in saying that to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, in a few minutes, um, Kat and Jackie are going to do our closing ceremony, and then we're going to have a little reception for everybody. I have a technical background. <laughs> I actually do. Even though I do this and I do this traditional work, my, my background is actually aerospace navigation, uh, communication systems with a specialty in missile navigation. So even though I grew up in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> so bonjour, wanna bonjour. Um, that history, those things that you hear, and actually us standing here, we're, we're kind of history in our sense. I was just saying to Jackie, because we've known each other a long time, we're actually related, and I was just saying, well, 20 years ago, you know, I wouldn't have thought we'd both be standing here in the university speaking uh, to people here, and it's, it's a privilege and it's a pleasure, and it's, uh, there's a lot more coming. So you're gonna listen to our words, and uh, my, my teacher and our, our good friend, uh, Roger Jones, Awewe Gabo, I can remember him talking one time and went, you're going to listen to my voice. And if you don't listen to my voice, there's a whole lineup behind me. His four daughters were there. He goes, they'll each come up and speak. And they have children growing up and they'll each come up and speak. So our voice will never be silenced. And I wanted to add in too that this, this idea, this concept of residential school wasn't confined to residential schools. I went to a public, my dad was in the Canadian Army. I went to a school, uh, DND, Department of National Defense. And they treated us Aboriginal kids just the same as they did uh, when they could in residential school. So the teacher thought nothing of taking a, a strap to us, the wooden stick to us, the, the ruler with the metal edge in it. If we spoke Cree, uh, anything Aboriginal, um, that, that concept that kill the Indian, kill the culture, that also extended to the other public schools. It was considered a normal thing to do, to actually squash our culture. That aside, we survive. We're survivors. We're people that walk. We continue to walk. And we carry ourselves, uh, in a sense, with pride, with that idea that that spiritual background that exists in everyone. The fundamental philosophy is the same for almost every culture and every belief. That's really simple. Be nice. Walk in a good way. Respect each other. Take care of Mother Earth do those things that we're supposed to do as people and walk the way that we're supposed to walk as people. That's really simple to do. And I see more and more and more of that. And I'm, um, I'm actually thrilled to be able to be, to be part of OISI and to be able to reach so many people and to be around these good people and the support and our dean. Wow, thank you. It's just so amazing. Um, and some of the people that help support us, I see here. These are good things coming together. These are answers to what we've asked for for a long time. These are things coming forward. And when I want to work towards that, I'm working towards it for these ones, the little ones coming behind us, for my own son. He's already got his University of Toronto t-shirt. He's five and a half. As far as he's concerned, he's already part of the university. And I want to make sure, that's part of why I'm so impassioned doing what I do here, is that he's, he's coming here. And I want to make sure it's a safe place because I don't want my child to walk anywhere that isn't safe for him. And I will stand beside him and these others and make sure that what they're walking to is a safe place and a nurturing place, and a good place for them to be. He has long hair. He come home from school one day and goes, Daddy, kids are yelling at me for having long hair. One of them said, you look like a girl. You look like Taylor Swift. He's got long, beautiful hair. So I, I took him to the computer and I showed him, I go, you don't look like Taylor Swift. <laughs> there's Taylor Swift, there's Taylor Swift. There's a whole bunch of Taylor Swift. At which point we hear mommy's voice going, what are you looking at? <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to the things that we have to go through, or we had to go through as people, and they're changing now. 
Now, I have some pretty strong opinions about some of this stuff, and I'm always careful in voicing them. I don't think we have any treaties in this country. It's because I asked my little boy about it. A treaty is something, treaty is an agreement between two peoples, two groups of people that's honored. I don't see that happening, therefore I don't see a treaty by definition. As a person working in the university, you have to go by the definition of word. I don't see that happening. So I don't think there's any treaties. And I'm sorry if anybody disagrees with me. You often come and tell me. The other thing is that reconcil that concept of saying you're sorry. I asked my little boy about that as well. He had something real simple to say. Saying you're sorry means you're saying that you'll never do it again. You promise never to do something again. If it's still ongoing, if there's still oppression, if there's still racism, if these things are still feeding through, then that word needs to be changed or the people seeing it need to change. One of the two. I don't think the word's going to change. So I want to honor the little ones that are here because those, those are the words we're listening to. These are the ones we're looking forward to. I want to welcome them in their journey here and, and thank Suzanne especially for all the stuff she's doing because she's standing here with her family. These guys are going to be the next seven generations. And you notice that picture with the, the, the kids standing there and they had a baby. I knew right away whose baby it was. You don't see that in mainstream so much, but we are growing fast. We're growing incredibly quick which means in a few years this room will have a lot more Native people in it. And I'm looking forward to that. Nahao miigwech. Nahao wena bojo minwa. I'm going to uh, share with you a healing song, and it's for healing Mother Earth and all our relatives because we are related. We don't see our God as being separate from us. We are. We are part of creation. We are all related. We are all related. So the song that goes out for the Mother Earth is a song that uh, was requested by the women of the Toronto community because they didn't have one song that was specific to Mother Earth. So Nishinaabe Kwe, in the old terminology, just meant uh, Earth Woman. And it is the same with Nishinaabe Nene. He is attached to the earth by the soles of his feet. Otherwise, he is a part of that sky world. So I'm going to share this song, and it was given in the most, in the best way. I gave up food and water and human company for four days and four nights. It was a beautiful time. I love that memory of that time. So this song came, and it talks about uh, how Nishinaabekwe truly love and appreciate the great winds. And we look to the eastern direction, and we say that, Gichimigwech. We look to the south, and we, we acknowledge the south in that same way, the west and the north. So uh, when the song is happening, you can think of anyone in your family who needs to have that healing happen, who needs to stop being angry, who needs to uh, fight for a just and real cause, not just because he's angry because his grandparents went to residential school. It is time to put away anger and approach each other with a, with a sense of friendliness and kindness. So that's what this song expresses, miigwech. Thank you. 